teaching of real life, real gospel. I'm your host, Josh Laborious, and I'm pretty sure this is episode 19. Although, I'm not 100% sure. Not that it's really that important. This podcast is sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. And every week, we release a podcast that talks about a real life issue submitted by one of you, someone listening to this podcast. And these, these issues are just questions about how our real life interacts with our faith, with Christianity, with the Bible, with all of these different aspects of our faith. And then how does that apply to how we should be living our lives? How does this apply to how we could live our lives? So... In pursuit of that, I do my best to keep this show realistic and grounded and accessible. A couple very specific efforts in that line of thinking are, I do try to avoid theological and academic and philosophical language. So for some of the things I talk about, yes, there, there is a philosophical or theological name for them. But unless I think that term is particularly helpful, I'm going to avoid it. So, if you're listening to this podcast in hopes of hearing some profound theological thesis, that's not what this is here for. If you're listening because you genuinely want to think about and consider and, and discuss how your faith interacts with your life, this is the right place for you. And this week, we're going to be discussing something pretty foundational to the faith. And this is something that was asked to me by a buddy named Kevin. He actually, he just got a call to be a pastor. But it's also come up in conversations with a a wide variety of different people. So the topic is the Bible. And specifically, the original question was, Why do I read my Bible if I don't get anything out of it? So there's this reality that people struggle with this topic. A lot of people struggle with this topic. I knew guys at seminary who struggled with this topic a little bit because there is this reality that the Bible is a hard book to read. So I want to start this off by validating if you struggle to read your Bible and to understand what you're reading and maybe that makes it harder for you to read it in the first place, I want to validate that struggle because the Bible is a hard book to read. The The ESV, the English Standard Version, which is the version of the Bible that I personally use, It's written at a 10th grade level, at least. The King James Version is written at a 12th grade level. The NIV translation is written at a 7th grade level. The NKJV, the New King James Version, is written at a 7th grade level. So, there is this reality that if you read from a certain version of the Bible, it can be exceedingly hard to read. Some people, they're level of reading comprehension isn't at a 10th grade level. If you don't read a lot, then that's where you're at. And I'm not judging that at all. I'm just saying, if your reading level is at, say, an 8th grade level, and you try to approach the English Standard Version, it is going to be an uphill battle for you. So there's that reality that it's just a hard book to read. The, The language itself is difficult sometimes. But then there's also this reality that I know my copy is 2,000 pages long. Over 2,000 pages long. It is a long book. Which makes it hard to kind of get through. Because it does refer back to itself a fair bit. And the the other aspect of it, liter- just speaking from it as a book of literature... It has poetry and history and inventories and architectural designs and narratives. And it has such a wide variety of different writing styles. That even if you may are may be comfortable with one part, another part is, is most likely going to give you difficulty. 
I know, for example, when I was in high school, I loved prose. I loved just reading books. But poetry? Oh, man. I, I disdained poetry. I thought it was absurd. I didn't really understand what the point of it was. So, for really the entirety of my life, the books of poetry in the Bible have been a, a struggle for me just because of the, the literary style they're written in. So there, there is all of these realities just looking at the Bible as a book, as a work of literature, not even getting into the reality that it's God's word and it has an incomprehensible depth to it. I mean, if you look at it, there are people who study very, very small parts of the scriptures for their entire lives, and they continue to notice and discover and realize new things when they come back to it. We have one professor at the seminary, he wrote a commentary on Obadiah, I think was the book. I haven't read the commentary. I haven't even bought the commentary, but I believe Obadiah is an incredibly short book in the Bible. Like, depending on how big your Bible is and how large the font is, it could be less than just a few pages. He wrote hundreds of pages of commentary on Obadiah. So there, there's this reality that there is an incredible depth to this book. And all of this goes to say the Bible is a hard book to read. It is totally understandable for it to be a struggle for us to read the Bible, to, to get something out of it, and to be motivated to continue reading it. But there is this reality that we're called to read it, to be in it. Jesus authorizes the scriptures. It, it constantly is coming back to the gospel. It's centered around Christ. So the Bible is one of our best ways to build our relationship with God, to strengthen our relationship with God. So despite how much of a struggle it, it is, and it continues to be, and it will continue to be, it's a struggle that we're called into. So the question that I want to get at going forward, the question I want to discuss is, really, how do we move forward with this? And how do we approach it? And how, how do we get into it? And what are some strategies for getting more out of it and, and understanding what you're reading and things like that? So that's that's what I'm getting at. So we've, we're have we about eight minutes into this podcast right now. And if if you're wondering, this, this sounds not encouraging so far. Stick with me, I promise. I'm going to get to hopefully some strategies that can help you if this is something you struggle with. Or maybe even strategies, you may may not struggle with this, but you may have friends who would need these strategies. So I would encourage you, hold on, stick with me, and we'll get to those strategies and hopefully we can um, help you out. So with that, this is Real Bible, Real Gospel. And our first text from the Bible that we're going to get at is Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. And it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. Sorry, I'm reading this off my screen right now and it's cutting off just the very end of some of these lines i'm severely afflicted give me life O lord according to your word accept my free will offerings of praise O lord and teach me your rules i hold my life in my hand continually but i don't forget your law the wicked have laid a snare for me but i don't stray from your precepts your testimonies are my heritage forever for they are the joy of my heart I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. So some explanation of this verse and where it comes from. So this, these are obviously verses taken from a Psalm. If I was to read the whole Psalm to you, we would be here for an hour because it is well over a hundred verses. 
but we're we're kind of going to walk through some of what this psalm is talking about because what it's talking about i think is the bible's not the bible specifically god's word and its impact in our lives so if we start off it says your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path so we have this reality that it is a light in our lives which is incredible and it's an incredible truth because the bible has these profound words of hope that speak to us in in whatever situation we're in. So I I was reading today, I was actually reading from an Old Testament book. uh, I was reading from, I think it was Haggai. Let me check. I'm going to flip to it right now. It it was Habakkuk, sorry. Or Habakkuk, whatever. However you pronounce it depends, I guess, how many degrees you have. Anyway, in chapter 1 it says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear, or cry to you violence and you won't save? Why do you make me see iniquity and, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. And then the Lord answers and he says, Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. So this is just an example of of the scriptures being a light in our lives. I read that this morning, and I thought, what a profound statement to speak into our lives, into my life today. As I struggle with this reality of the coronavirus and not being able to, to meet with people and speak with people in person... And not being able to worship with people. And and the Lord speaks into that. I'm doing something so incredible. That you wouldn't believe me if I told you. And that gives me such comfort that, that in the midst of disaster. In the midst of tragedy and struggle and strife. God is working anyway. And he's working something awesome. So in that way, I think the scriptures can be a light in our life. And continuing through this psalm, which was our original text, it says, I've sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. And it comes back to this impact a little bit, because the reality is that the scriptures are a guide to live. It tells us here is how there there are tips for parenting. There are tips for, for working, for employment, for marriage, for stewardship, for taking care of our finances. The Bible is an incredibly practical book. Now, it, it's not going to give you a specific 12-step plan. It's not some motivational speaker. But it gives us principles from which to operate in our lives. Which is... I guess, a distinction. So there's this idea that the Bible is a guide how to live and it can be a profound impact in our lives. Going through some of the other parts of the psalm, it says, accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord. And there's this reality that the Bible teaches us how to praise too. And it gives us words when we, we don't have them on our own, especially if you look to things like the Psalms. And various characters throughout all the scriptures as they sing praises to God, it it gives us something to reflect. And then finally, there's this, this really cool part at the end of these verses. It says, your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. And there's this other impact of the scripture. It is, it is a heritage in our lives. It connects us to, to Christians that have gone before us for, for, generations and it connects us to Christians who have come afterward so there's this cultural reality that it's a it's an impact in our lives in that it connects us to the other people of our faith across time and across the world so that's kind of if, if we look at this psalm and break it down these are some it's speaking to joy over these impacts that the the word of god has in our lives but what i what i want to emphasize to you today is that over and above all of those impacts 
over it being a light in our lives and guiding us how to live and, and praise and being a heritage for us. More important and more profound for you and I is it is our connection to the gospel. This is how we know about Christ. Now, I and I'm going to get into this discussion a little later, so if the sentence I am about to say throws you for a loop, put a pin in it, hold on to it, I'm going to come back to it. I don't want to communicate that the only way to come to Christ is through the scripture. There are people, there have been people, and there will continue to be people who have never read the Bible, but they have still come to faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and people share the gospel just by speaking to one another, and by communicating the good news of Jesus Christ verbally. Not necessarily quoting Bible passages, just speaking to one another. But, that kind of distinction is something I want to talk about a little more later, so we're going to put a pin in it. And all of this is to say, it doesn't answer the original question. And I'm aware that it doesn't answer the original question, because you might say, oh, well, it's great that the Bible has all of this for me, but what good is that if I don't understand it when I read it? And I hear you. And I, I want to commiserate with you a little bit, because there is this reality that I don't understand everything I read either. When I, I I actually, I had this realization this morning too when I was going through my personal readings. I was reading from Zephaniah and he was speaking a prophecy about a variety of ancient nations and the things they had done and how God was going to punish them. And I I very distinctly thought, as I looked at that list, I said, I have no idea where these nations were, who they were, what their relationship to Israel was, or really even what he is referring to that they did wrong. So, I, I can connect with you on some level of reading things in the scriptures that I don't understand. But there's this reality that... The scriptures kind of guide and explain themselves. And that doesn't make sense at first. And you may say, well, I haven't experienced that. And what I want to share with you is a terminology. It's not theological. It's not necessarily academic. It's not philosophical. It is educational. For those of you who don't know, I was a education studies major at, well, for most of my time at Vanderbilt, I was a secondary ed major, but um, I didn't want to actually have to do student teaching for a license that I wasn't going to use, so my senior year, I switched to educational studies, slightly beside the point. Anyway, so in education, at least at Vanderbilt, we had a phrase, and it's a phrase that got used a lot. It's it's <coughs> called... The phrase was, things are more caught than taught, or things are caught and not taught. Because there's this reality that the words you say, the things that you try to teach in a classroom, only go so far. What students learn more from is kind of the things they just pick up as they see things, and as they experience things, and as they work through things. And... I think the scriptures work this way too. Because there's this reality that you don't have to understand everything to understand something. So, say the first time you read through the Bible, you understand 5% of what you read. Only 5%. The next time you read through... That 5% is going to equip you to understand more the next time. Because you're going to catch details and things are going to stick out to you and things are going to resonate with you. And then when you go back through again, you're going to remember those things and say, there's a connection here. 
for example, one of the things I, I caught was in, in one of the lessons that my dad taught. He, he taught our high school Bible study when I was in, when I was a kid, when I was in high school. So one of the things that he taught, and I don't remember what book of the Bible it was from. I don't remember where in the Bible it was from, but he, he made this connection between Jesus and the Passover lamb in the Old Testament. And how the Passover lamb had to be unblemished. And that's why Jesus was had no, like, that's why they didn't have to break his legs when he was on the cross. And the way he was sacrificed to connect us with God is very similar for the way animals were sacrificed in the Old Testament. And he made all these connections with Jesus as our as our sacrificial lamb. And that really stuck out to me. So the next time I read through some of those Old Testament texts, I had a whole new understanding and a deeper understanding of that sacrificial system as I read through. So there's this reality that if you read through the the scriptures, stick with it because even if you only understand 5% this time, when you come back around and when you read through part of it again, you're going to understand more. Maybe you're going to understand 7%. Or 8%. But if you're persistent with it, you're going to understand more and more and more. And I, I want to support you in this. Because the first time I read the Bible through, on my own, cover to cover, was when I was in 10th grade. And I guarantee, as a 10th grader, I probably did not understand nearly as much as... as as an adult or as someone who has studied it. Like, I didn't read commentaries. I didn't do background research. I just read. And I'm sure a lot of it, I had no idea what was going on. But then in 11th grade, I read it again. And I understood a little more. And when I was a senior, I read it again. And almost every year since then, I have made it all the way through the Bible. And I, I want to tell you, I, learn, I have learned more from just reading it over and over and over again than I have from any class at seminary, from any theological book I've read, from any commentary. And all I did was read it over and over again. So that's what I, that's what I want to encourage you with is you don't have to get a PhD to understand the Bible. You just have to read it. So... My application, and here's the first place I'm going to give you some very practical tips for accessing scripture. The first is find a version that you can that you can access. Find a version that is is at your reading level. I, I know one person in my life that isn't a super strong reader. An incredible person, not a super strong reader. But they're, they're dedicated to getting into the scriptures. So you know what they did? They downloaded a children's version of the Bible. And have been reading through that. And the understanding and the, the consistency of the reading that they're sharing with me is incredible. Just because they went out and they found a version of the Bible that was written at a level that they could interact with. So that's the first. And if you need to seek out an easier version, I would say 100% go for it. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Go for the easier reading level. Um, And then the next tip I have for you is, in reality, just do it. It will impact your life. It, It won't be profound necessarily at first, Slowly and surely, it will impact and change your life through what is caught, through what you pick up, through what stands out to you each time. So that that is my application from this first section for you. And there's this reality that I want to close this text off with, that the Bible is a tough text to get into. And it's kind of depressing because there is also this reality that we will never be able to understand the depth of it. Because it is the wisdom of God for his people and we are not God. 
So we can't understand the depth of his wisdom. But the gospel here, the joy I I have for you, is that God has given us this awesome way to connect to him. And he gives us light and joy and guidance through his word, through the Bible. And that's what it has to speak into our lives. So with that, I want to go on to a greater joy and talk about how the Bible connects us to Jesus. And for that, I want to look at the text Luke 24, verses 44 to 49, where it says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So the textual notes I have here, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples after the resurrection. And another textual note I I have for you is it says everything written about him in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. This is a descriptive way of saying basically the Old Testament. You have the law of Moses, you have the prophets, and the Psalms. So I, I guess... This doesn't necessarily include some of the historical books, but I'm not going to split hairs on it. Anyway, so the, the point of this statement, of this word to the disciples and him opening their minds, is that the whole of Scripture is about the gospel. It all points to Jesus. And there is this reality that using it for anything else is misusing it. There's this thing that is really popular. It's it's something called proof texting. And I don't know if this is a theological word, but if it is, it's pretty helpful. So I'm going to use it and I'm going to explain it. Proof texting is when you take a verse or two completely out of context because when taken out of context, they support your point. For example... Maybe you take the story of Peter in the in the garden and he cuts off the, the ear of a, of a Pharisee and you use that to say violence is acceptable, violence is good. That's taking it completely out of context because in the garden, Jesus then immediately rebukes Peter for cutting the guard's ear off and heals the guard. So there's there's this reality that using it for our own gain, taking it out of con- taking scripture out of context is misusing it. Context is key and this is why I am an advocate for reading the entire Bible because First of all, it's important to see where passages come from. Not just take a verse or two, look at the entire kind of story that it's a part of. And also there's an important far context of what does this say in relation to the rest of Scripture. If there are different ways to understand this passage, what understanding is most in line with everything else in the Bible? So it is important to to have a grasp on as much of it as we can. So, a a tangent on this, and this is a tangent that I'm going to pursue because it is something that frustrates me. It's a tangent on fundamentalism. And if you have been a part of my Revelation Bible study, if you've watched those videos, or if you were part of the in-person class, you've already heard this. So, sorry, you're going to hear it again. Fundamentalism is problematic for a variety of reasons. And the first one I want to bring up is that the public image of fundamentalism is terrible. It's terrible. And there's this reality that people say, well, the public image of fundamentalism isn't of real fundamentalism, so we should fix the public image. 
And my my response to that is our faith is not in fundamentalism or any other label. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. So if it's easier to witness dropping the label of fundamentalism, drop it. Drop it like a hot potato. So that's that's one of these issues I have with fundamentalism is the public image is terrible. But then there's this cycle that it drives Christians into. So I think we can accept that in the world outside of fundamentalism, the public image is bad. It's conceived as anti-science or hateful or homophobic or like what <laughs> it, it it's bad. The connotations are bad. People do not think fondly of fun. So there's this problematic public image. Which result, like, the, the response to that in people who are fundamentalists or are sympathetic to fundamentalism is, is a desire to defend scripture. Because somewhere along the line we conflated fundamentalism with scripture. So people get into arguments in their defense of scripture frequently. And these arguments then turn to science to argue on the same level as the people that they're picking a fight with. Which is problematic because it takes the eternal out of our arguments. If you're arguing only on the on the basis of science, you're really you're crippling yourself because the joy of the Bible isn't in its historical accuracy. The joy of the Bible isn't in in certain, I guess, scientific truths or whatever you want to call them. The joy of the Bible is in the gospel. Is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that is a miracle. That is God reaching into the world and working. And that is something that you will never be able to prove with science. Because science didn't raise Jesus from the dead. God did. So there's this reality that when we're arguing... When, when people argue to defend scripture, they try to turn to science and say, well, this scientific evidence points to scripture being true. Which results in us putting faith in the ability to prove the Bible, not in, in Jesus. So, there's, which then results again in this, in this cycle. It, it feeds back into this reaction of, of the problematic public image and, and more arguments and more turns and then our faith is placed in... So, fundamentalism, I think, drives a lot of people into a cycle that is destructive and harmful. Both for Christianity as a faith, for their witness, but also for themselves. And I'm, gonna, I'm about to say something that might sound a little weird, but there is this reality... That our faith is in Christ and Him crucified. Not in the Bible. Our faith first and foremost is in Christ and Him crucified. We believe in the Bible. And we have faith in the Bible and what it tells us because He said to. And that's what we see in this text. He says the law and the prophets and the Psalms, they point to me. He authorizes them. We don't believe in Jesus because the Bible says so. And like I said, that's a bit of a weird statement and it might be something you have to wrestle with a little bit. And if it's something you're really struggling with, please reach out to me. I'd love to talk about it. But I think if you sit and think about it a little bit, there's a lot of truth to that. So, my rules for fundamentalists, if you insist on identifying as such. These are Josh's rules for fundamentalists. One. Don't argue with scientists if you don't understand science. Okay? Don't make stuff up because all it does is make all of Christianity w look worse. I was a I was an education major in, at Vanderbilt. I was also a major in mathematics and I focused on theoretical mathematics. I understand math. When people make arguments about math and the patterns found there and they use them as evidence for God, I can step into that argument. I am equipped for that. 
if you watched one lecture of an angry guy talking about math and faith on YouTube, you are not equipped to argue with a mathematician. In the same way, I, I have a roommate from undergrad. He was a microbiology major. He is equipped to have scientific discussions and arguments, if necessary, with people about science and faith. He is equipped for that. He studied it. He knows it. He, he knows how the science works. If you have never read and understood a scientific research article, you are not equipped to do that. In, in reality, we really shouldn't be arguing anyway, but my follow-up to this is, and this is rule number two for fundamentalists, don't set up straw man arguments. And by that I mean you, you don't take points that are going to be really easy for you to quote-unquote win on and then set those up as real arguments. It's painfully transparent. Everyone knows what you're doing. And again, it makes all of Christianity look kind of bad. And then rule three for uh, rule three of Josh's rules for fundamentalists: um, answers in Genesis is not a great scientific source. A lot of their quote unquote studies are poorly done and are straw man arguments. So what you really get is when you look at a place like Answers in Genesis, is at least in my opinion, you get the worst of both worlds. Because you get faith that stay, that sticks to kind of what they can quote-unquote prove. Which doesn't put the focus on Christ and his gospel. And then on the flip side, you so you get kind of the quote-unquote worst, less joyful part of Christianity. But then you also get kind of the worst of the scientific world because you get either... I guess studies they can easily disprove or you get strong, like, it's just not good science. So, those are my rules for fundamentalists. Take it or leave it. Uh, apologies about the rant, but it is over now. This is the conclusion of my tangent about fundamentalism. So, how I want to conclude on discussing this passage from Matthew is that scripture points us to Christ. Other things we can get from Scripture are important. There are lessons we can take away from Scripture that aren't necessarily Jesus died and rose from the dead. They're connected to that. I don't want to say they're not, and they don't point that way, but there are other lessons we can take. We can take lessons on finance and character and behavior and living and marriage and all of these other things. And they point to Christ, yes, but they can be helpful over and above that as well. But faith in Christ is what matters more than anything. We want to deepen our relationship with him. So when we, when we get these other things from scripture, it's not worth sacrificing faith in Christ. And I'm going to take this a little bit of a different direction because there's this reality that things we learn, like we learn about the creation and we see how incredible God is. And that is an awesome thing. But if someone has faith in Christ, but they don't believe in creation, they believe in evolution. That's not a hill I'm going to I'm going to die on. I'm not going to sacrifice their faith. I'm not going to push them away from the church. I'm not going to push them away from Christ because they believe in evolution. Am I going to am I going to have conversations with them about it? Yes. Do they maybe have some logical consistencies, inconsistencies that we can talk about? Quite possibly. But if they have their faith in Christ, at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, I am satisfied. Because that is how we're saved, not because we have a right understanding about everything else that happens in Scripture. So this reality is we seek Scripture to uncover Christ. To see how it points us to him. And we are called to interact with all of it. Because it all points to Christ. But there's this gospel that. It does all point to Christ. And that there's this faith in Christ that matters more than anything. And we, we want to deepen our relationship with him. Because he loves us and he saves us. And we do want to deepen our relationship with him. With, which drives us to our last passage, which I think is going to make this the longest podcast I've ever released, 
It's on 2 Timothy 3. As for you, continue in what you've learned and firmly believed, knowing from who you, whom you learned it. Um, from childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which make you wise to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So this is in the middle of a letter written to Timothy about holding to the faith. This gets at the reality that scripture deepens our faith. It is for our good, so we should interact with it. It makes us wise for salvation, so we should interact with it. It helps us to withstand storms in our life, so we should interact with it. And it equips us for God's mission in our lives, so it sh we should interact with it. How do we interact with it? And here's, here are some more practical tips. Again, find a version that's accessible. Listen in church, in Bible study. Like, if you are seeking to understand Scripture better, go to people who understand Scripture and listen to, to the things they have to say. Just read it. Like I said earlier, I learned more from just reading the Bible over and over than I, than I ever did from a class or a, a textbook. Um, but if you are looking for a textbook, if you do want kind of that expert opinion, look for a commentary. But I do want to warn you to be careful with commentaries. Be careful with these because a lot of people write them with baggage. They have an agenda. They have a point. They have something they're trying to get across. Some of them are very specifically trying to shape the Bible to their own ends. So really... When you're reading a commentary, you have to seek to distinguish between factual and editorial. Behind, between things about history and stuff like that, and then editorialized comments about what it means and, and things like that. If, if you want to be 100% safe, I would recommend a, the Concordia commentary series... I don't know if you can get them on Amazon. You can get them on Logos or you can get them from CPH. They're an iconic blue bound. Uh, I think a lot of them are, a lot of Bible, of the Bible is covered already. They're still waiting to publish some, but most of the books of the Bible are covered at this point. So the final thing that I want to have for you based on this is, don't make demands of yourself for understanding the Scripture. Uh, scripture will do the work. The Holy Spirit will do the work in bringing you the understandings you need. So just be in it. Interact with it. Read it. And if you finish a reading and you didn't get much out of it, just keep reading the next day. So there, there is this hard, hard reality. You should be in Scripture. That is, that is a demand that scripture puts on you. That's a demand that I'm putting on you. And in, there's also a reality that it's going to be tough sometimes. Sometimes you might read a chapter. Sometimes I read a chapter and I look back and I didn't get much from it. Read it anyway. Is, is the reality. We, we're, we should be reading it anyway. And that can be frustrating. It can be really frustrating to read something that you don't understand completely and to try and be okay with that. But the gospel proclamation, the joy I have for you is that it does, it will build your faith. The Holy Spirit will work on you to create more deep understandings. And it's all for salvation in Christ. It all points to Christ and to his gospel and to the joys of that. And so the, the summary of this podcast, I guess, is get into the Bible, period. I, I hope it was helpful. I hope you maybe heard some strategies that were helpful for you and your any struggles you might have in getting into the scriptures. Um, not going to take up too much more of your time because I realize I'm already at 44 plus minutes. So... Just for your information, do subscribe to us, whether that be St. Paul on YouTube or subscribing to Real Life Real Gospel on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, 
on Google Podcasts or on Podbean. If you have any topics you want me to cover, reach out, let us know. And I think that's all I got. So with that, this has been Real Bible, Real Gospel, episode 19 of Real Life, Real Gospel. And I've been your host, Josh Laborious. Brothers and sisters, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.